morning, uh, I'm here at the home of my, my good friend, Professor David Purdy, uh, to discuss what I hope will be the, the first in a series of talks about Burns' works, both his, uh, his poetry and his song. Uh, and in particular today, we're going to be visiting Old Lang Syne. Uh, now, David, you are uh, also the, the editor for the forthcoming edition of the, of the Burns Encyclopedia, am I right? I am, I suppose, two co-editors. Professor Carruthers and uh, Dr. Christine McHugh of Glasgow University. Yes, indeed. Uh, how's, how's that going? Well, it's easy if you're asked uh, how things are going with an encyclopedia because you give the letter. You know, we're at N, so we're more than halfway through the alphabet and with the O's and the Q's and the X's and the Z's to come, we're more, well more over halfway and it's downhill now with a projected um, publication in the autumn of next year. Fabulous. Fabulous. Um, you're also the curator, am I right, of, of Old Lang Syne? The honorary curator. The honorary curator, mm -hmm. uh, which is held uh, down at Alloway uh, at the Birthplace Museum. Why did you choose, out of, out of the various different things that you could have chosen to curate, why did you choose the manuscript for Old Lang Syne? It was always the favourite with my father and uh, with our family. And uh, because it is the iconic song of parting, the song of dismissal. Mm -hmm which took over when Burns uh, had it in print, when it appeared in the museum, the Scots Musical Museum. It immediately took over from Good Night and God Be With You All, as the, which was the, the previous song of, of, yeah. of Parting, that's mm -hmm. right. And um, the fact that the, the National Trust uh, asked me if I might be interested in this uh, triggered it off, so the family got together and we decided we would become the honorary curators mm. uh, of the manuscript. The manuscript does not need curation at the moment, it's in good shape, but should it need it then the family or my descendants will be responsible for uh, conserving it and uh, restoring it if it needs such. Mm -hmm. Now you lit on, on the fact there David that, um, that the song did exist in previous incarnations but certainly not in any... Not in any finished form no. that we would regard as, as finished and to our modern eyes. Mm -hmm. But it certainly was a very old song, in fact he wrote to Mrs Dunlop to say that is not the old sentiment, Auld Lang Syne, a wonderful sentiment, or worse to that effect. Mm. In other words, Auld Lang Syne simply means old long ago, or long, long ago, in the, in the Lallans, in Burns' mm -hmm. Old Scots. And uh, the fact that old acquaintanceship should not be forgotten, but should be conserved and restored and uh, cherished, was triggered off by a letter to Burns from Mrs. Dunlop saying that she'd met an old school friend. Uh, and that letter can be read among the collected letters of Burns. And that triggered the, the poet in turn to say, well, it's a wonderful sentiment. And it triggered, it, it uh, chimes with Auld Lang Syne, which itself is a song. Burns knew there was a song. Mm -hmm. And there, in fact, are several versions of it. One by Alan Ramsey. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never thought upon, the claims of love extinguished and follies past and gone, and then on and on and on. It was extremely long, mm -hmm. prolix verbose and not suitable uh, in Burns's eyes or in ours today as a, as a great song and uh, in fact an iconic song of parting as it turned out to be. Mm. So Burns touched it with the genius and produced the five verses which we have today for Old Lang Syne. The original air uh, which had been set uh, to the Ramsey uh, uh, words is the one which I think is perhaps the best. It's not the one used today. No. It's the, the one we all know. It's a more later version of yeah. the of the air. Yeah. But I think the you know the original air is coming back into back into vogue. Uh, you know, I certainly I, I've been more aware of it in the last four or five years. More and more individuals picking up on it. Certainly, Burns enthusiasts, I think, uh, are virtually you know won over to the original yes. uh, tune now. Interestingly, you know, I mean, a lot of Burns songs, you know, have come to be known to, to melodies other than that to which they were written, mm -hmm. and the melody for Old Lang Syne, while the, uh, I, I, I do believe that believe that the that the original melody has a, a, a melancholy, um, uh, flavour to it that, that you know that isn't existing in the uh, you know in the in the in the tune that we all. Mm -hmm have accepted as, as being the melody to Old Lang Syne, but it doesn't have such a profound effect, the change of the melody, as some of the other 
uh, melodies that have you know that have been used to you know they sometimes utterly change the mm. character yeah, of a song right. altogether. In yeah. particular, my love's like a red red rose. I think you know the whole the whole character of the song yeah, is right. changed by. Whereas Old Lang Syne, I think you know the uh, the melody which is which is the accustomed melody is. Well, first of all, it was uh, you know it, it, it was a melody which was accepted by Burns because obviously, as you were saying, Johnson had already used the the, the original melody for Old Lang Syne for another song within the music. You don't happen to know what that is by any chance? I don't. But no. we, we can find out. Yes, it was. And, and also, I think the the uh, Johnson uh, Johnson had published the the Ramsey words uh -huh. to to uh, to a melody, uh -huh. not the one that Burns chose for. Okay. I agree that the uh, the original melodies are often very worth while listening to yeah. in the context of Burns's words because he was the master of marrying words to music, Absolutely. Uh, as as Beethoven observed in his correspondence with George Thompson, mm. and in fact several of Burns' occasions, including our own, the Edinburgh Burns Supper, uh, the songs sung at that Burns Supper are sung to the original airs now, yes. and for example the we've been talking about Old Lang Syne, but the very the birth song. You know, if you like, ranting, roving, robin, where mm. the poet sings of his own birth, um, is far better set to the tune "Dainty Davy," yes. which is much slower. It's a strath spade. It's yeah. much more thoughtful and wistful and uh, contemplative than the rant, which yeah. is the the tune that we all know when today. Dead, and yeah. it's very useful to see audiences given both back to back and see which they prefer. Indeed, and I think many of them do prefer the uh, the Burns original one. Yes. And you mentioned uh, the Red Rose. I mean, the original tune, I love the original tune, which is uh, Major Dream of Inchbracky, mm -hmm. which uh, should be sung at least a couple of verses perhaps to an audience before we sing the Low Down in the Broom, which is the one we all know today. Mm -hmm. But of course, Scottish audiences, and especially audiences abroad, if you start with the original tune, they'll think well, that's the wrong tune. Yes. <laughs> you have to be told carefully that that is, in fact, the tune that Burns selected yeah. for it with his unerring ear for the marriage of words to music, yes. which add together to be greater than the sum of the parts, which Absolutely. a great song is. Absolutely. Because I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's necessary, absolutely necessary, for the, for, you know, for, the, for the lyric to be married to the melody which Burns created for it, but I believe that it is necessary in order to, in order to understand the lyric yeah. to at least know yes. the original melody. To, you know, to have come to terms with the original melody because, as I say, you know, in certain songs it utterly changes the meaning of the song. Uh, I, I, you know, I feel, uh, you, the, the, you know, the very fact of, you know, where a, where a minor placement is as opposed to a major placement uh, can, can, can make you immediately think about, a, a, you know, a, a completely different yeah. psychoacoustic uh, you know, a psychoacoustic psycho uh, experience. You're absolutely yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> but what you're saying, in, in, if I could put it into plainer English, is that the uh, the, the song itself, the, the melody, the air itself, is in fact an interpretation of what the words are. Indeed, the air is in fact a, a means to interpret. It's, it's a, another dictionary, if you like, for what the poet thought and meant and what he wanted the words to convey. Absolutely. Um, and very few uh, uh, song writers, song smiths, have been able to do that. No, you can you could name them on the um, on the fingers of both hands, perhaps in the European tradition, who have been able to do that, and um, the and Burns always, of course, worked from the from the air. Yes, the air was chosen first. Yeah. Beethoven was interested in this too. He didn't yeah. work from the words. That's, that's uh, you know, it's an interesting point. I re I, I recall uh, hearing a paper by Luisa Cello. You remember mm -hmm. the flautist. Mm -hmm. Um, and she gave a paper uh, down in down in Manchester last December, in fact, uh, about uh, Beethoven and Burns, and it's always been uh, the accepted um, wisdom that Beethoven wasn't in command of the uh, of the uh, you know the lyric mm -hmm. because Thompson deliberately kept him in the dark mm -hmm. and deliberately didn't send him. The, you know the text to go along with the melody, but Beethoven was smarter than that, and he went and he, you know, he discovered the texts for himself, mm -hmm. uh, for himself, and, yes. and married them together in order to, uh, because uh, you know if you hear Beethoven, uh, for instance, his uh, his interpretation of the lovely lass of Inverness, when you're given the melody, 
simply, you know, the ear to mm -hmm. the lovely lass of Inverness. You wouldn't think it was a particularly melancholy ear, but what Beethoven does with it makes it very tragic indeed. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the yeah. lovely lass of Inverness is, uh, you know, it's about Claude. And oh, yeah. yeah, it's about loss and uh, destitution, in fact, uh, political and, and personal as well. Mm -hmm. Beethoven obviously had access to the words. So we've often wondered about that because he repeatedly asked Thompson, send me the words, send me the lyric. Yes. Uh, and he would get it interpreted. He didn't speak English, but no. he had means to interpret. He and Thompson co corresponded, as you probably know, in French, mm. because Thompson didn't have German and Beethoven had no English, so they, they talked in French together. But he repeatedly and, and uh, testily demands the words. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think to a certain extent, to save him the hassle of going and finding the words, oh, because right. he was going to do that anyway. Oh, sure, sure. sure. It would, you would know, not have been easy to find a harmonic edition in, in no. uh, in, in Berlin or Vienna, wherever he happened to be at the no, time. No, uh, no but th that's, that's the beauty of it all. Vicky, in one of the letters, he expresses his astonishment that Burns had no formal training mm. in uh, musical theory or the practice of composition. And, and Thompson says, no, no, he was an autodidact. He, he taught himself. He, he had this ear for music. And we know he had a musical ear because um, he was a great mimic. We know that from the conversation of his friends, that he was famous for his mimicry of other people. He, he was, he was the, uh, the, the Rory Bremner of his day. <laughs> he could actually be other people, you know that. And if you've got that ability to mimic an accent, or to mimic uh, 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 accent or uh, intonation or dialect, then that's the same facility as having a musical ear. You can hear it in your head. An accent or a dialect is music. Yeah. And therefore that's what he carried home with him. He wrote down the, the, the singing of, of spay wives and ale wives and fisher wives and people of all conditions of society. He wrote it down because he carried notation with him on his tours, in his saddlebags mm -hmm. or in the chaise with, with Willie Nicholl. Mm -hmm. And these he carried back to Edinburgh. And uh, we know from an eyewitness account that uh, at the home of the uh, Cruikshank family where he lodged that winter, the second winter in Edinburgh, that the, the daughter of the house, Jenny Cruikshank, who was 12 years old, would play the air on the harpsichord over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And Josiah Walker gives that description to us mm -hmm. of him not being allowed into the room with Burns and Jenny Cruikshank because they were working. Sure. And at a table beside the harpsichord, strewn with paper, the poet sat drafting and redrafting and crafting the words until they fitted the air. Always in that sequence, the air first, and the words then grafted into them mm -hmm. until they fitted like a hand in a glove. Yeah. And indeed they, they, you know, they certainly do in the case of Old Lang Syne. And the, yeah. you, the, the curious thing is that uh, Johnson, of course, asked Burns if it was, if it was possible to, you know, to, to, uh, to, to marry the melody which he had for Old Lang Syne, the melody which has come down to us as the accepted melody for Old Lang Syne to the lyric. And uh, Burns acquiesced, of course, and I think in the uh, in the creation of 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 a new song because it does become a new song and it becomes a less plaintive song, I think. Yes. Allied to the you know to the accustomed melody, and yet such are the strength of Burns's lyrics that he still created a song. I recall hearing Eddie Reader saying at one stage that uh, you know which he which he was talking about uh, what made Burns great to her was that. He had written a song which made people hold each other. <laughs> and I think that's a wonderful turn yeah, of phrase. Yeah. And a wonderful paradox too, because it's a song of separation. Indeed. It's a song of parting, like so many of the great songs, it has actually got a melancholic twist to it. We twa he piddled in the barn from on and sun till dine. But seas between us long her roar. It's an old line side. It's very wistful. And it's, uh, but they come together again. It's a song of reunion. Absolutely. as well as the song of parting, and that's what brings people together in the final verse and allows it to become that great song of dismissal, of parting. Nunc Dimitis Domine, the only comparable song in the literature. Mm. Well, David, thank you very much for your time, and, uh, and I hope we can, uh, we can revisit another work very soon. We will indeed. Good. Thanks. Excellent.